We live in a strange time. Extraordinary events keep happening that undermine the stability of our world. Suicide bombings, waves of refugees, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, the mainstream media, social justice, critical race theory, COVID-19, even Brexit. Yet those in control seem unable to deal with it. No one has any vision of a different, or a better kind of future. This is a story about how over the past 40 years, politicians, finances and technological utopians, rather than face up to the real complexities of the world, retreated. Instead they constructed a simpler version of the world, in order to hang on to power, and as this fake world grew, all of us went along with it, because the simplicity was reassuring. Even those who thought they were attacking the system, the radicals, the artists, the musicians, and our whole counterculture, actually became part of the trickery, because they too have retreated into the make-believe world, which is why their opposition has no effect, and nothing ever changes. But this retreat into a dream world, allowed dark and destructive forces to fester and grow outside. Forces that are now returning to pierce the fragile surface of our carefully constructed fake world. The story begins in two cities at the same moment in 1975. One is New York. The other is Damascus. It was a moment when two ideas about how it might be possible to run the world without politics, first took hold. In 1975, New York City was on the verge of collapse. For 30 years, the politicians who ran the city had borrowed more and more money from the banks to pay for its growing services and welfare. But in the early 70s, the middle class fled from the city. The taxes they paid disappeared with them. So the banks lent the city even more. But then they began to get worried about the size of the growing debt, and whether the city would ever be able to pay it back. Then one day in 1975, the banks just stopped. The city held its regular meeting to issue bonds in return for the loans overseen by the city's financial controller. Today the city of New York is offering for competitive bidding sale 260 million tax anticipation notes, of which 100 million will mature on June 3rd, 1975. The banks were supposed to turn up at 11 a.m., but it soon became clear that none of them were going to appear. The meeting was rescheduled for 2 p.m. and the banks promised they would turn out. The announcement on behalf of the controller is that the offer, which we had expected to receive and announce at 2 o'clock this afternoon, is now expected at 4 o'clock. Paul, does this mean that uh, so far nobody wants those bonds? We will be making a further announcement at 4 o'clock, and anything further that I could say now I think would not advance the interest of the sale, which is now in progress. Does this mean that you have not been able to sell them so far today? We will have a further announcement at 4 o'clock.
What happened that day in New York marked a radical shift in power. The banks insisted that in order to protect their loans, they should be allowed to take control of the city. The city appealed to the president, but he refused to help. A new committee was set up to manage the city's finances. Out of nine members, eight of them were bankers, which was the start of an extraordinary experiment where the financial institutions took power away from the politicians and started to run society themselves. The city had no other option. The bankers enforced what was called austerity in the city, insisting that thousands of teachers, policemen and firemen were sacked. This was a new kind of politics. The old politicians believed that crises were solved through negotiations and deals. The bankers had a completely different view. They were just the representatives of something that couldn't be negotiated with the logic of the market. To them, there was no alternative to this system. It should run society. But the extraordinary thing was, no one opposed the banks. The radicals and the left-wingers who, ten years before, had dreamt of changing America through revolution, did nothing. They had retreated, and were living in the abandoned buildings in Manhattan. The singer, Patti Smith, later described the mood of disillusion that had come over them. I could not identify with the political movements any longer, she said. All the manic activity in the streets, and trying to join them, I felt overwhelmed by yet another form of bureaucracy. What she was describing was the rise of a new, powerful phenomenon that could not fit with the idea of collective political action. Instead, Patti Smith and many others became a new kind of individual radical who watched the decaying city with a cool detachment. They didn't try and change it. They just experienced it. Instead radicals across America turned to art and music as a means of expressing their criticism of society. You, oh, there's a lot of things like when you pass by mo big movie houses, maybe we'll find one, but they have li little movie screens where you can see clips of like Z or something like that. People watch it over and over. I've seen people, I've checked them out all day. I've gone back and forth and they're still there watching the credits of a, of a movie because they don't have enough dough, but it's some entertainment, you know? They believed that, instead of trying to change the world outside, the new radicalism should try and change what was inside people's heads. The way to do this was through self-expression, not collective action. But some of the left saw that something else was really going on. That by detaching themselves and retreating into an ironic coolness, a whole generation were beginning to lose touch with the reality of power. One of them wrote at the time, it was the mood of the era, and the revolution was deferred indefinitely. And while we were dozing, the money crept in. But one of the people who did understand how to use this new power was Donald Trump. Trump realized that there was now no future in building housing for ordinary people, because all the government grants have gone. But he saw that there were other ways to get vast amounts of money out of the state. Trump started to buy up derelict buildings in New York City. And he announced that he was going to transform them into luxury hotels and apartments, but in return, he negotiated the biggest tax break in New York's history, with $160 million. The city had to agree because they were desperate. And the banks, seeing a new opportunity also started to lend him money. And Donald Trump began to transform New York into a city for the rich. At the very same time in 1975, there was a confrontation between two powerful men in Damascus, the capital of Syria. 
One was Henry Kissinger, the U.S. Secretary of State. The other was the President of Syria, Hafez al-Assad. The battle between the two men was going to have profound consequences for the world. And like in New York, it was going to be a struggle between the old idea of using politics to change the world, and a new idea that you could run the world as a stable system. President Assad dominated Syria. The country was full of giant images and statues that glorified him. He was brutal and ruthless, killing or imprisoning anyone he suspected of being a threat. But Assad believed that the violence was for a purpose. He wanted to find a way of uniting the Arab countries and using that power to stand up to the West. Kissinger was also tough and ruthless. He had started in the 1950s as an expert in the theory of nuclear strategy, which was called the delicate balance of terror. It was the system that ran the Cold War. Both sides believed that if they attacked, the other side would immediately launch their missiles and everyone would be annihilated. Henry was not a warm, friendly, modest, jovial sort of person. He was thought of as one of the more uh, anxious, temperamental, self-conscious, ambitious, inconsiderate people at Harvard. Kissinger saw himself as a hard realist he had no time for the emotional turmoil of political ideologies. He believed that history had always really been a struggle for power between groups of nations. But what Kissinger took from the Cold War was a way of seeing the world as an interconnected system. And his aim was to keep that system in balance and prevent it from falling into chaos. And it was this idea that Kissinger set out to impose on the chaotic politics of the Middle East. With all the dislocations we now, now experience, there also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society carried up by the principle of interdependence. And if we act wisely and with vision, I think we can look back to all this turmoil as the birth pangs of a more creative and better system. If we miss the opportunity, I think there's going to be chaos. To manage it, he knew that he was going to have to deal with President Assad of Syria. President Assad was convinced that there would only ever be a real and lasting peace between the Arabs and Israel if the Palestinian refugees were allowed to return to their homeland. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were living in exile in Syria, as well as in the Lebanon and Jordan. Assad also believed that such a peace would strengthen the Arab world. Have you found that the Palestinians here want to integrate with the Syrians at oh, all? Oh, no, no, never. They don't want not here or neither in Lebanon or in Jordan, never. No, because they want to, to stay as, as a whole, as a Palestinian as uh, they call themselves those who go back, El Aidun, they say in, in, in Arabic. But Kissinger thought that strengthening the Arabs would destabilize his balance of power. So he set out to do the very opposite, to fracture the power of the Arab countries by dividing and breaking their alliances, so they would keep each other in check. Kissinger now played a double game, whereas he termed it, constructive ambiguity. In a series of meetings, he persuaded Egypt to sign a separate agreement with Israel. But at the same time, he led Assad to believe that he was working for a wider piece of work, one that would include the Palestinians. 
In reality, the Palestinians were ignored. They were irrelevant to the structural battles of the global system. When Assad found out the truth, it was too late. In a series of confrontations with Kissinger in Damascus, Assad raged about this treachery. He told Kissinger that what he had done would release demons hidden under the surface of the Arab world. Kissinger described that, Assad's controlled fury, he wrote, was all the more impressive for its eerily cold, seemingly unemotional demeanor. Assad now retreated. He started to build a giant palace that loomed over Damascus, and his belief that it would be possible to transform the world began to fade. A British journalist who knew Assad wrote, Assad's optimism has gone. A trust in the future has gone. What has emerged instead was a brutal, vengeful Assad, who believes in nothing except revenge.